In regards to preaching, Paul and I spoke last year and he said to me, I'd like you to help. Oh, thank you, my darling. What a, this, this man is wonderful. <laughs> he said to me to move this forward and I forgot. Um, Paul asked me last year, he said... <laughs> <laughs> he said, um, I'd like you to help build into the prophetic culture in Gateway. And I, you know, that for me, that's such a privilege because it's my passion. And, and I know that God is so committed to building prophetic companies of people where we set a standard that we show what it looks like to become the norm, to operate in a, in a prophetic lifestyle of just being so tuned in to what God's seeing and saying and doing and, and living with that and partnering with that. So, so for me, it's such a delight to have this opportunity. And, and I have many messages prepared on the prophetic, on growing in the prophetic. It's something I've done for a while and I love it. But I really felt this week that God asked me to do something different. He said, no, don't just preach one of your messages that you've got, but there's something that is so core to the heart of the prophetic and that is understanding the Father heart of God. Yeah. Because you, you can develop all the skills and the gifting and excellence in the prophetic, but if you don't understand the Father heart of God that he wants to reveal to his people, then the Bible says it's like a noisy clanging gong. Because the prophetic is not just about words. There's a resonance that happens with the prophetic where something in people opens up and starts to receive the love of a father and I've seen many prophetic words given that, that have been damaging where people are spoken to in a way that is harsh and not redemptive where people are called out and personal information is revealed in front of hundreds of people that is raw and deep and personal and private or where people are rebuked in public in a way that's not redemptive. And, I, and I've spoken to people who have been to see clairvoyants and psychics, and they've had very, very accurate words of knowledge from those people, but I want to tell you that none of those things bring life. But one word that comes from the Father can change a world forever. Because the prophetic is not about information. It is all about relationship. And so I'd like you to, if you've got your Bibles... You can turn to Luke 15, verse 11. And I want to read from this account of the prodigal son. And, and please don't switch off when you hear that. I know sometimes you go, oh, I've heard this a million times. But there's something I really believe. Because of the, because of the call that's on this church, there's a very, you know, every church represents the purposes of God, but there's unique callings on each church. And I think because of the prophetic and the revelatory call on this church, God is really wanting to build deep because... Before there comes a release, well, not, I mean, there already is some release, but as God, I know that God is wanting to increase. Paul was talking about what, you know, what God wants to increase on this church. And, and if we're going to be safe for him to release that and open up those doors, there needs to be an understanding of his heart. So this is a really, really key, important message. So reading from verse 11, it says, There was a man who had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me my share of the property that, that's due to me. And so the father divided his property between the sons. And not many days later, the younger son gathered everything he had and he took a journey into a far country. And there he squandered his property in reckless living. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country and he began to be in need. So he went and he hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him in the fields to feed the pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate, but no one gave him anything and, and you know we often call that the story of the prodigal son or the lost son but really it's the story of the waiting father because the emphasis in this parable is on the love of the father yeah. not on the lostness of the son and, and this is a story that would have caught the attention of the Jewish people and that's who Jesus was speaking to because he's talking about a younger son demanding his inheritance before his father died and leaving home. And that, that broke with Jewish tradition. Legally, um, the son could do that. But in that culture, it's probably one of the most insensitive things that a son could do to his father. And, and given that, 
this father, this father responds in a really unusual and remarkable way because, you know, Jewish people have a reputation for being very savvy with money. They're not fools. They, they know there's something on them as a race that knows how to steward wealth well. Okay? But this man, he says to his son, he says, okay, I'm going to give you what you ask. And it's probably a bit like if you had a 15 or you're a 16-year-old son, those of you that have had, had sons or daughters, and they came to you and they said, hey, Dad, I really want to buy a jet ski. And, and to, to run my jet ski around, I need a really good car, I want a Prado or something like that. And so, Dad, I need 100 grand. So how about that, that holiday house that's been in, that, in our family for generations, who Grandma left to us in her will, if you sold that, then you could actually divvy up the money amongst us. That, that's, that's the equivalent of what it would be like. And, and the dad says, OK, we'll sell the holiday house and we'll split the money and you can have your share now. And, and you can kind of imagine the Jewish men in the crowd snickering behind their hands. OK, you're right. What, what sort of father is going to give the money to the son? What father in his right mind would do that? What is, what is the point that Jesus is trying to make now? You see, because Jesus is a master of using parables to set people up and then to go for the jugular. Because the whole point of pictures and stories is they get around our way of thinking. They get around our, our grid and our mindset to the things that we can't see. Good. Good. And Jesus is using this father-son relationship as a picture of the relationship between Father God and his people. So what is the statement that Jesus is making about this father? What, what, is, what is this father doing when he says to the son, you can have the money that you've demanded? Because here is a young boy that is going to embarrass him. He's not going to stay home and honour his father as it's customary in the culture. He knows what he's going to do. He's going to go and squander his wealth. And the father knows him. He knows... He knows what's likely to happen and how it's going to end up. And instead of sitting down and giving him a lecture, he releases the money to him. And that is just so contrary to the nature of Jewish fathers. So how is that a picture of God? Because the easiest thing for this dad to do would have been to all put all kinds of cultural pressure on the boy. He could have called in the rabbi, the priests in the village, the elders, the, the uncles, just to say, look, this is what's going on. Can you please talk some sense into this boy? It wouldn't have been very difficult to do to get him to conform to, one, to what he wanted to see happen. You know, that's pretty much what I would have done. I would have been, sorry, Matt, buddy, there's no jet ski and no Prado. It ain't going to happen. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like, lucky you didn't speak to Steve. <laughs> but this father did give his son what he was asking for. And the point that Jesus is making... Sorry, I have hair in the microphone. Just one minute. The point that Jesus is making is that this father wanted something more than for his son to stay home. He wanted something more than his son's presence. He wanted something more than for his son to conform to the behaviour which was expected by the people in the village. Right. What was it that this father wanted more than all of those things, more than conformity and behaviour and performance and money? The thing that he wanted and the thing that he went for was a heart relationship with his son. He wanted a trusting relationship where there was a heart connection. And so what he did is he gave the money to his son because he knew that in his heart the son had left home already. And when he gave him the money, he, he made a statement to him. He said, you are more important to me than the money. You are more important to me than what the elders in this village think of me. And if you leave home, which you most probably are going to do, then you're actually more important to me than my reputation. And the most valuable and the most precious thing that could ever happen is for you and I to be reconciled and have a heart relationship. And the father, see, he recognised that there was, there was a broken connection between him and the son. And he wants the son to love him because he knows how much he's loved by the father. And so he wanted to build a bridge 
into the heart of the son so that when the son came to the end of himself, there was a bridge there for him to come back to the father. And if we pick up in verse 17, it says this. It says, When the son came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread, but I'm perishing here with hunger? So I will arise and I will go to my father and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. So treat me as one of your hired servants. And he rose and he came to his father. And it says that while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion. And he ran and he embraced him and he kissed him. Uh, has anyone here ever rehearsed an apology? I know that I have, you know. Okay, I think this is what I'm going to say. and I'm, These are the words. I'm going to practice it and go through it in my mind to try and get a good outcome. And this is what this son was doing. And, you know, we have this picture of the father every day walking from his house down the driveway to the road. And it says that in the distance he saw this figure that looked familiar. He saw a gate that he recognised and it says that he had compassion and he ran. And that boy did not even get the words of apology out of his mouth before his father had his arms around him and was hugging him yeah. and was kissing him. You see, there, there is nothing that you can do that will make him stop loving you. A man, um, Floyd McClung, you may have heard of him, uh, he worked in Amsterdam for many years um, in ministry. He tells a story of a, friend, of, a, of a guy in his church and he was sitting in a pub in Amsterdam and he said God spoke to him and he said, see that man over there? I want you to go over to him and I want you to tell him that I love him, I have a destiny for him, there's nothing that he's done that I won't forgive. And so the man's like, okay... So he said, okay, God, if this is really you, I want, I want the music. I want you to stop the music. So I'll know this is definitely you and I'll go and do it. And he said, it was, it was sort of a couple of decades ago. So he said, after about three minutes, the tape recorder broke down that the music was playing on. And so he thought, okay. And he got up and he went over to this gentleman and he said, listen, I felt like God just spoke to me. And he wants me to tell you that he loves you, that he's got a plan for you, he wants to use you, and there's nothing that you've done that he won't forgive. And he said, the man started to laugh. And the man looked at him, he said, do you know who I am? And the guy said, I have no idea who you are. He said, I am the high priest of the Satanist church. And I don't know, I hope for your sake you don't know too much about the Satanist church, but a little bit that I do know, it, the things that go on there are some of the most horrific things that, that I could possibly imagine. And, and the point of this story is not, I don't know what the outcome was, that's not the point. The point of this story is, is that no matter what someone done, has done, there is nothing, there is nothing that can God stop God from loving us. See, God made a covenant with us and he pursues us. And even if we break the covenant, he doesn't break his covenant and he continues to pursue us. There's a theologian called Karl Barth from long ago and he says God actually doesn't want to be God without us. Because the relationship with us, like Paul said this morning, he delights in us and the relationship with us is so important. There's a, there's a story of a, of a professor of theology and he lived next door to a, a family with a young boy and, and the young boy begged his father for a cricket set. And uh, the father's like, I know what's going to happen if I get you a cricket set. And, he, and Anyway, the father gives in and he gets the young boy a cricket set and that the young boy's playing out in the backyard one day and he hits the ball and, of course, it goes through the neighbour's window the professor's window and so the, the young boy's afraid he does not want to get into trouble with his father so he runs in and he just hides and the next day the young boy is playing out of the front of his house and as he's playing he sees a professor walking home from work and so he runs and he hides in his house and the next day the same thing happens again and so th this continues for a few days and on the fifth day the young boy's playing out the front of the house he sees the professor walking home and he runs but the professor chases him and he catches him and he grabs hold of him he says listen he said it's okay I've paid for the window I'm not mad at you it's all okay and I'm not going to tell your dad you're not going to get into trouble and he says the little boy looks at him he's, and, and, and the professor says to him all I want to do is to be friends with you and the little boy looks at the professor he says no I hate you I hate you you see sometimes that's our response to God because we're so caught up in our own pain and guilt and shame and wounding and, and, and the professor so genuinely wanted a relationship with this little boy that he just starts to weep. 
And when the little boy saw it, it just undid him, and he puts his arms around the professor. And, and the next day, when he's playing out the front, and he sees the professor walking home, and he runs up to him, and he picks up his briefcase and carries it for him. But you see, it's like God's saying, it's okay. I've paid for it. I've got this, and I love you. Yeah. I remember someone coming into our church a few a years ago now, and, and they, they started to talk about, you know, people here, it's like you actually have a picture of God as an angry God. And he said, it's not in the forefront of your mind. He said, but the way that it happens is this. It's like when things are going well in your life and you're praying and you're spending time with God and you're treating people really well, you know, you come and you have these wonderful intimate times with God. But then you have times in your life where you're not really praying and you're, you know, you're not treating your husband that well and you're not quite doing the right thing in your attitude and your thoughts and the way you treat people. And he said, and when you're like that, you feel like I can't come into the intimate place because God's going to disapprove of me. And I realised that was me. He says that deep down you feel like God's angry with you. And, and he said, he read from Isaiah 54 verse 9, and he says, As I swore that the waters of Noah should no more go over the earth, so I have sworn that I will not be angry with you and I will not rebuke you. For the mountains may depart and the hills may be removed, but my steadfast love shall not depart from you. And my covenant of peace shall not be removed, says the Lord, who has compassion on you. You see, he is not going to give up on you, no matter what you've done, or no matter what's been done to you. And in my line of work as a counsellor, I see many, many people who've been abused as children or neglected. And as a young child, when, when your primary caregiver or your parent is treating you in a way which is wrong and is not loving, it is impossible for a young child to survive believing that about their parents. And the only way they can survive is to turn that on themselves and say, it's my fault, there's something wrong with me and I'm bad. And we see that a lot in people. And I want to say to you, there's nothing that has been done to you, and I believe this with my whole heart, that Jesus cannot heal you of and cannot set you free of. I, I was having some dialogue with God recently about one of the most broken people that I've ever worked with. And, and I was just dialoguing with God about it. And, and I felt that for a few minutes, it was like in a really, really diluted form, God actually gave me his heart for this person. And I don't think, I know it was diluted because I couldn't have borne the full expression of what it was because it felt like I would have felt if some of those things had been done to my child. It was so horrendous. And in that moment, like God really broke my heart for his bride. And he reminded me of something he said to me many years ago. And he said, Alona, my bride is walking with a limp. Won't you help heal them up so they can get free to run in the destiny that I've created them for? And I believe that the question that God is asking us as prophetic people is, will you help restore my broken bride? Will you let her know who she really is and let her know that she's loved? Because, my friends, that is the prophetic. That is the prophetic heart of God. As human beings, we desperately need someone who loves us, who will care for us, who will give us meaning and who will come to us when we're broken and traumatised and will heal us and make us whole. And, you know, a lot of people look pretty good on the outside and they're pretty messed up on the inside. And I think you'd be surprised some of the time. Psychological research is quite interesting. We've known for many years that our early relationships with our caregivers and authority figures shape how we relate to people through life. But what they're finding now is that those relationships very much shape the way that we perceive God. And, and none of us come from perfect parents. I'm a parent myself and I was far from perfect, so I'm not having a go at parents here, but I'm just being very real that most of us, to some degree or other, have a distorted picture of God. Most of us feel like we have to perform for God. I know when I do sozos and counselling, this thing comes up time and time again, how high how high is that, <laughs> that benchmark that I have to try and live up to that I don't measure up to? And what, what we think about God is the single most important thing in our lives. 
Because how we perceive God is going to affect how we think and how we feel and how we live. And how we connect with God is going to totally determine how we prophesy and how we minister to people. And God delights in revealing to us the facets of him that we haven't seen clearly. When I was a teenager, um, I really loved God. And I, and I, gave, you know, I gave my life to God very early in life. <laughs> all except for one area, and that was the area of boys. Because I knew what God was like, and I knew if I let him choose the boy, he was going to be really boring, really geeky, and there was certainly not going to be any chemistry there or attraction. (laughs) So I'm like, God, everything else is okay, but not the boy thing. And so I chose a boy. I went out with a boy. And he, I thought, there is no way that that God could better this boy. This, this is the man, you know, he's like everything that I would think that I would want in a man. And when, when I started going out with him, I knew the Holy Spirit said to me, Lona, this is not what I've got for you. But I, I knew what God was like, and I knew that there's no way he could find me someone as nice as this guy. So I went out with this guy for 18 months. And if I'm very honest, it was probably the unhappiest 18 months of my life. It was not a good, wasn't a good relationship. Um, but I, I didn't want to let go of it. Because, you know, even though I was unhappy, we do silly things, don't we, when we're teenagers and maybe adults. <laughs> and one day, after 18 months, this, this man said to me, Alona, I can't marry you. I don't love you. I can't marry you. We need to break up. And I was kind of really devastated, but I was also really relieved. Because deep in my heart of hearts, I knew it wasn't right. And so that night... In my bed, I said, God, I have held this area of my life back from you, but I surrender it to you. And, you know, when I said it, I meant it wholeheartedly. But I've got to be really honest. I don't know if I would have stuck to that. And the thing I love about God is that when the prodigal son was coming back, he was in a distance. And I feel like, what, you know, when, when I said this to God that I'm going to surrender to you. I thought, I know what God's like. I've disobeyed him knowingly for 18 months, so he will want to teach me a lesson. So I know it's probably going to be a couple of years before I meet someone. I understand I've got to learn something, and you know. And and I know, I think God knows me quite well, and I think he thought, I've got to get in quick, because she's got this beautiful turn of heart. It's like she's come out of the pig pen. She's started the word home, but I'm not sure how far she's going to get, so I'm really going to run and meet her at a distance. Okay, And so the funny thing is that night, the night that this man broke up to me, with me, just before then we went to a 21st party and, and this really handsome blonde-headed man walked in the room <laughs> called Steve Potter. And I, I was, you know, I wasn't single, so I, I thought, well, he's nice, but, you know, I'm in a relationship. <laughs> you know, yeah, well, probably wasn't quite as pure then as I am now. And um, I'm not really that pure, but anyway. Um, but you know... I made this decision to go with God, and two days later, Steve and I caught the same bus together. I saw him in town. Actually, I saw him in town, and I decided to catch the bus. (laughs) I thought, oh, there's that nice-looking man. (laughs) And and, (laughs) and he he didn't have much chance, I've got to tell you. And and he gave me a lift home from the bus. And my mum said, who is that? I said... That's Steve Potter. He's Mike Potter's brother. I said, I think I'm going to marry him. (laughs) But you see, the thing is that God totally changed my perception of him because he brought the most wonderful man in my life. And this man, I've been married to for nearly 30 years, is the best husband of anyone I know. I'm sorry to all the other guys out there, but he is the most amazing husband. I I couldn't ask for more. And what, what God showed me was that what I thought I wanted... You know, what I thought, this picture I had of God, like God just went, I can so far exceed what you can do for yourself and what you want. And so he used this situation of, of me, I've just been so disobedient. And he just said, the minute I turned, he, he was like, he'd actually already placed Steve there and this thing happened crazily quickly. And it's just like God saying, let, let me show you who I am. Let me show you what kind of father I am. That, that, that is what he is like. And you see the whole purpose of the prophetic is to reveal the heart and the nature of God. And it's to be an invitation into closer relationship out of which comes healing and restoration and empowerment. And that there is not a person anywhere to whom God does not want to reveal his incredible kindness. Many Christians have actually given up on the kindness of God. 
because they've had such bad relationships with other people and they just automatically project that onto God, sadly. But God is completely different. He's not human. He's divine and he has a very, very different character. And prophetic ministry flows from a desire to see people have life and to have freedom in Christ and to see people transform from places of captivity and brokenness into knowing that they are loved and they are treasured and they are adored and, and that freedom to grow in the fullness of everything that God has created them to be. You know, prophecy is all about seeing through the eyes of the Father. We have to develop a culture in our heart that starts to see people the way that God sees them. To prophesy to them the true identity that he is calling out to them. I remember um, when one of my kids, I won't say who it was, when they were four years old, they had a birthday party. And then this kid was pretty kind and pretty sensitive generally. But at this birthday party, one of their friends came along and they were so mean to their friend. You know, it's pretty heartbreaking as a parent when that happens. And so, so after, after the party, I sat this kid down and I said, you know, you're normally, you're a really kind kid, I know that. And, and the way that you treated that friend today was not kind, it's not who you really are. And I know that if that happened to you, you would have been really upset. Because I know who you are and I know you have a kind heart. And, and you know, doing that to, to, to my child, they just, they just broke in a really good way because they're like, yeah, I am kind. And, and they went, and even at four, they, they, they repented and they said sorry. Because I wasn't just pointing out their sin to them. I'm saying, actually, this is who you really are. You're not, you're not acting like what's in you. You see, God is looking for people that he can trust with people's hearts. We cannot function in the prophetic outside of the kindness and the love and the mercy of God. Very All right, James 2 says, Mercy triumphs over judgment. So we get to look at people and see the best versions of their best selves. The prophetic anointing lets us see people as God sees them. Instead of seeing their mess, we see their hunger, we see their deep desire for God, we see their purity and we see their loveliness. Prophetic ministry is about drawing out of people what God has already placed in them. It's like we need to be like owls because we get to see through the darkness and see light. You know, when we're prophetic with the heart of God, we can look at a Rahab and we don't see a prostitute. We see the great, 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 great grandmother of Jesus Christ. That is what we need to be as prophetic people. We need to be really passionate about the prophetic. Guys, I want to stir you today. If you don't feel passionate about the prophetic, ask God to stir you with a deep desire because of what it does in people's lives. Okay, well, we get to come with the heart of God looking for the gold that is placed in people. And we get to love on the people that no one else sees gold in. That's what Jesus did. He picked fishermen, he picked tax collectors, he picked prostitutes, he picked people whose lives were a mess, and he picked people who had made big messes. Some of the people that we write off, people who've messed up. Because if something happens to people when you love them, with God, you love them into gold. When you, when you see potential in someone and you believe in that, I know what it's like when someone sees what's in me and believes in that. I know what it does in me. When you see potential in someone and you believe in them, it creates a relationship that draws that thing out of them and pulls them up to actually be the person that you're saying that they are. And there, there are many people with a big call in their life who have been traumatised and destroyed. And we need to ask God, what is it that they have to bring to the world that's being withheld? Okay, the prophetic sees what is not and it calls it forth as though it is. And we cannot do that based on anointing or gifting or ministry skills. Because before the prophetic is a gift, it is a culture. And it is a culture of your heart that begins to see people differently than they are. We, we, we honour people not because of how they are acting and how they are behaving. We honour people because we are made in the image of God and we reflect God and that's what he does. Because it is the, it is the kindness of God that leads people to repentance. And when a true prophet ministers, no one is afraid. Everyone feels safe. And the confidence in God starts to build and people again, and as they listen and they start to see God for who he really is, then they start to fall in love with him all over again. 
So to develop it in the prophetic, prophetic, we need to develop a culture in our heart that says, Father, what is precious at their core? What do you see that? What do you love most about them? And what are the words that you want to say to them? And, and how do I start to treat them that way before I even say the words? See, Jesus treated tax collectors as though they were worthy and full of honour and friends. And the prophetic bridges all kinds of gaps with people, so we create connection, especially with the unsaved. If you don't love the person in front of you, then don't open your mouth. If I have judgment or a hidden agenda in my heart to someone and I don't value them, how are my words going to value them or how is the Holy Spirit exactly. going to value them through me? And if you want to accumulate favour in the prophetic, you've got to develop a culture in your heart that attracts heaven to land on you. We are called to reconciliation. That is the, the main role that Jesus did. And Paul says that we are ambassadors of reconciliation. Reconciliation means a restoration to divine favour. We are called to restore people to divine favour and to help them know what does it feel like, remind them what it feels like to be loved by God. And it's a heart culture which says to people, you are worthy and I bless you. And I want you to know what it's like to be so loved by God that you will change everything and you will fight for that love. So I'm going to speak into your heart of hearts, God's blessings. Because in that culture that I plant into you, you're going to start to get addicted to what it feels like to be a child of God. And I'm going to treat you like a son because you are a son. And I know I've told this story before, but I'm going to tell it again because I think it's a really good story. When we're in the psychic fair in Sydney doing outreach and you're doing praying for healing and prophecy and dream interpretations and this this young girl came in and she was she just came in to the to the booth and she had I can't even remember what happened to her but she had this amazing encounter with God and so, and so she walks out and her boyfriend this young man is standing there watching and she walks and she goes to him that was amazing you've got to go in there he's like uh -uh, I'm not going in she goes no 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 you've got to go in there he goes oh and she, she drags him in there and he sits down in front of us and we look at him, and I look at him, and he is shaking. He is white, and he is petrified. I said, Father, what's going on? And God said to me, he's so ashamed. He's done something in his life that he's so ashamed of. And he knows that you're the real deal. And he's so scared you're going to expose him. He's going to get exposed. And I just said to him, I just feel like God's speaking to me. And he wants you to know that he loves you. And he's never going to expose you. It doesn't matter what's going on in your life. He will never expose you. He's got your back and he will, he will protect you. And this young man broke and he wept. He said, where can I find people like you? Tell me where there is a church that has got people like you in. And that, that is what the love of a father does to someone. Prophetic ministry is love-based. The best thing you can do if you want to grow in the prophetic is to pursue love. Sean Boltz. Has anyone heard of Sean Boltz? Sean Boltz is, <laughs> I, you know, listen to him on YouTube. He's, he's an amazing prophetic man in terms of his degree of accuracy, but he's also got an amazing heart of love. And, and he says this, he says, you cannot have authority over what you don't love. He, he leads a church in LA that mainly ministers to people in the entertainment industry. And he mixes with all the A-grade actors and singers. So, you know, he gets exposed to stuff. People that come to his church, just we wouldn't even have a grid for what normal church is like. And, um, and he gets to meet all sorts of famous people and prophes they invite him to their seances to prophesy over them. And he goes into the strip clubs and prophesies over people. He's just got this incredible grace of God on his life for people that are so far out of our grid. And, and he was, said he was talking one day about this particular um, singer, famous singer, and he was just saying, I actually hate what she's done to the music industry. What, what she has brought into the music industry has just so defiled it. And he said, God spoke to him, and he said, Sean, I was actually going to set up a meeting between you and this girl because I had some things I want to speak through you to her. He said, but I can't do it now because you didn't keep your love on towards her and you had judgment in your heart towards her. If there are people in our lives that we have judgment towards, we are not going to have the authority to prophesy into that sphere. 
and the cleaner in our heart and motives that we become, the more God is going to entrust with us and use us. God always, always speaks to our potential. In Luke 19, Zacchaeus was a much-hated tax collector. Okay? He, he ripped off and defrauded most of the community. And, you know, we often think he was up that tree because he couldn't see, but I think maybe he actually didn't feel quite safe on the ground because maybe he was going to get a knife in his back. And I don't think it was his dream to have to hide up trees. I think deep down he desired to be loved and accepted. And, you know, Jesus could have eaten in the house of anyone in Jericho that day. I think anyone would have been, you know, they would have been, (laughs) anyone would have wanted to have him. But he comes to, his, to Zacchaeus, who everyone hated. He said, hey, Zacchaeus, get down from the tree because I want to come and stay with you. And he didn't, he didn't prophesy sin over him. He just came to his house and he showed him love and he showed him acceptance. And there's this immediate response in Zacchaeus. He said, half of what I have, I'm going to give away to the poor. And he said, if I've defrauded anybody, I will give them back four times as much as I stole from them. You see... When we suspend judgment and we walk in love and acceptance, whole communities get blessed by the changes that happens in people. When we are thinking about operating prophetically in our relationships with the people around us, in our sphere of influence, a really good question to ask God is this. Father, what conversation are you orchestrating with this person at this time? What aspect of yourself is it that you're revealing at the moment? And sometimes it's not going to be the answer that you think you would give. I was in a, a few years ago, I was really, really stepping out in, in wanting to you know the word of knowledge. And I've got to be really honest with you, because I think we need to keep it real, that I feel like I've pulled back on that. And I'm like, God, I want to really be, I just started lately, I want to step out in that again. Okay, But I, I was really stepping out and I was in this shop, um, I think I was looking at buying, we were buying a new bed. And I went into the shop to look at some beds and there was the lady that served me, luckily there was no other salespeople around and I was with this lady and I said, Father, do you have a, something, a word of knowledge or healing? And I felt like he said, her back's in pain. And so I said to this lady, look, do you have, are you in back pain? She said, oh my goodness, I'm in so much back pain. When I get home from work, I just have to lie down in the beanbag, I can't move. And I said, well, I feel like God showed me that because he really loves you and he wants you to know that he loves you. And she looked at me and she wept. She started to weep. She goes, I know about God. She said, I, I was married to a pastor for years. I was in church and I was married to a pastor. I had a family and, and, and we were part of a really big family of pastors in a denomination. And we had a really, you know, we, we were sort of the family that had all the pastors in the denomination. And she said, I cheated on my husband. I had an affair and I left my husband and my kids for this man. And she said, I, I caused such devastation in my family and in the church and the denomination. She said, they hate me now. They want, no, they want nothing to do with me. And I, and I know why. I deserve it. What I, you know, I've just caused such heartache. She said, I can't believe. I can't believe that God would send you to tell me that he loves me and he wants to heal me because I don't deserve it. You see, that, that is what God is like. It's like, Father, what is the thing that that person needs to know about you at the moment that he hasn't given up on you, that he actually still loves you, nothing's changed as far as he's concerned. Yes, there's consequences of your actions, but his love for you has not changed. And the only pressure we need to be under is the pressure to be loved by God and to actually allow that to translate into a love for other people. If we want to move in the prophetic, we need to have a heart conditioned by love so that no matter, no matter who comes across your path, you can love them. Right, uh, one of the toughest gigs, the times I had to pray and minister to someone with a friend was for someone who had been a pedophile. I, I was kind of okay with it, but my friend said to me, I, I don't think I can do this. I don't know if I can minister to him. It's too close to home. And she said to me, well, you pray, you, you minister and I'll just pray. I said, okay. And so as she's sitting there praying, something happened in her heart and God broke her heart for this man and he gave her a word and that word transformed this man's life because she actually caught the father's love for him. She couldn't do it on herself, but when she caught the, the love of a father for him, she brought a redemptive word that transformed that man's life. 
So as prophetic people, we need to experience the love of God in a way that makes us aware of what he is doing in the hearts of those to whom we are ministering so that we become a conduit for God's love to flow to someone. Because love teaches us to see what God is seeing, what is feeling, what is saying, and what is blessing, and we get to do all those things.